Welcome everyone. This is George Potoski. I'm the PNC Technical Trainer for the Learning and Development Group at GE Digital Energy. This presentation is the introduction to the Universal Relay Platform. There are other videos available that will describe the hardware, software, and many other features of the Universal Relay. So, let's begin. In the UR Platform introduction, we'll cover the following topics. Communication terminology, LAN topology, LAN networking, UR applications, GE product comparison, architecture of the UR, hardware basics, and finally, online ordering. There has always been a need to transfer information between people, businesses, etc. The main objective of a data communication system is to transfer information from one place to another. Let's discuss the different types of communication links. First, we have the simplex communication. This is a communication channel that sends information in one direction only. It's a one-way street, so for an example of this would be a, a radio or a TV broadcast. Next, we have the half duplex, where the communication can flow in both directions, but only one device can talk at any one time. In general, a number of connected devices have to take turns in transmitting data. This is a fairly common mode of operation where there is only a single network medium between devices. An example of this would be a pair of two-way radios where one person can speak at any given time. Full duplex refers to the transmission of data in two directions simultaneously. For example, a telephone is a full duplex device where, because both parties can talk at once. The transfer of bits in a communication system requires a tightly controlled electrical environment. For data communications across the short distances between the components of microprocessor-based devices, such as a computer, the environment usually is stable and so parallel communication links, known as buses, are common. For data communication with other external devices located some distance away, the environment often has a lot of electrical noise. The electrical properties of the cable and external noise lend serial communication a strong advantage over parallel communications, and so serial communication links tend to be the norm. This serial link is referred to as a LAN. LAN is an abbreviation for local area network. Typically, a LAN can be considered as all of the components that make up a data communication system, which allows a number of independent devices to communicate directly with each other. This connection is over a small geographical area, such as a building. A WAN, or wide area network, is formed by the interconnection of LANs over a wide area. A typical example of a WAN is the utility application would be the network that is formed by the interconnection of the substation and control center's LANs. The distance between the LANs forming the WAN could be from a few to hundreds of kilometers. A protocol is the link between the user's application and the communications link. A protocol is a common set of rules governing the exchange of data between devices on a network. We can equate the protocol to a language such as English, French, or German that might be used to exchange thoughts and ideas between two people. There are certain rules associated with the correct use of the language. The same is true of a protocol. The protocol determines such things as the initialization of the data link, the idea that devices agree to exchange data, this is called a logical connection. Many devices have the ability to have more than one logical connection, or if you prefer, a conversation at a time. The actual conversation is referred to as a communication session. The protocol also determines which services that are supported, things such as reading, write, reading from or writing to device, flow control, frame format, synchronization, and error control. When LAN, when LAN access was used in a half duplex mode, a tool called CarrierSense Multiple Access Collision Detection was introduced. This transmission method was used in older Ethernet networks that shared medium using unmanned switches, such as a hub. At any moment, only one frame from one station was transmitting in one, di in one direction, as we understand half duplex. The receiver confirms that the data was received with an acknowledgement back to the sender. With CSMACD, if the network is busy when a station wants to transmit, the station waits a random number of microseconds before trying again. However, if two stations coincidentally transmit their frames exactly at the same time, their signals will collide. Since an acknowledgement was not sent back to the sender, both stations will wait a random duration before retrying. For example, 
If the blue and green Ethernet devices transmit a message on the Ethernet at the same time, a data collision will occur. The use of CSMA CD will eventually deliver the message. Today, collisions have mostly been eliminated because shared Ethernet gave way to full duplex point-to-point -point communication between the sender and the receiver. In full duplex, all components can support simultaneously transmission and reception of data. The managed switch buffers the data traffic to avoid data collision, in which in turn optimizes the LAN performance. In this example, the blue and, blue and green devices transmit a message on the Ethernet network at the same time. One of the messages will be buffered at the switch, and the other message will be passed through to the other ports. Once the blue message has been transmitted, the switch will send the green signal automatically. In North America, tra traditionally Modbus RTU has been the most popular protocol used in industrial power applications. Modbus uses a half-duplex mode utilizing a master-slave protocol. There is one master on the LAN and multiple slaves. Each slave is assigned its own slave address. The master initiates communications with other devices by using the unique slave address, or the master can send the command to all slaves using the broadcast address zero. In Modbus, the slaves cannot initiate communications with the master or each other. The next proto protocol type we'll look at is DMP3. DMP stands for Digital Network Protocol and is the most popular for utility applications. Utility power applications require the central control center to receive very fast notification of field changes and record the change of the millisecond accuracy timestamp. Unfortunately, the master-slave protocols such as Modbus RTU couldn't meet the overall communications performance requirements needed to report timestamping to the millisecond accuracy. In respect to these deficiencies, GE Harris developed the Digital Network Protocol, or DMP3, whose features allow for the optimization of control and data acquisition between the equipment in the substation and the central control center. Foremost in the development of the protocol was the ability of the protocol to be scalable. It utilizes a client and server relationship where the client acts as the master and the server acts as the slave. DNP operates in different modes. One way is that it reports status upon request known as pulled status, which is the same as the master-slave configuration. Another way is to report by exception, known as pulled for change. In other words, inform only if a change occurred. If no changes have occurred since the last time we move, last time we move on to the next device. The IEC 6150 protocol is rapidly gaining worldwide acceptance, at least among the power utilities. The goal for utilities in both North America and Europe for many years has been to define a substation communication infrastructure that will allow seamless vendor independent integration of the IDs and higher level devices such as the substation HMIs and the central control center clients. Within IEC 61850, the communication infrastructure has been grouped into three areas, the substation to the control center, the station bus, and the process bus. The IEC 61850 standard uses a publisher-subscriber format similar to a newspaper. The publisher provides different pieces of data where the subscriber can then subscribe or use a specific piece of data for its own reporting. 61850 allows for peer-to-peer -peer communications. Each device can publish and or subscribe. All devices behave equally. Any device can initiate, publish. For instance, uh, communications when an event occurs. An event can be an analog signal that has exceeded a preset limit or a digital signal that has changed state, say from a 0 to a 1 or a 1 to a 0 or open to a closed, etc. The published data is broadcast and has no confirmation of data reaching its destination. More details about this in another module. In utility and industrial applications, multiple SCADA masters RTUs are constantly retrieving pertinent information about their process in the form of analog and digital data. This table acts as a guide to provide the number of logical connections as per each protocol. Here we can see the number of simultaneous connections over the same network. So you can see for Modbus TCP IP, we have a maximum of four logical connections. IC61850, a maximum of five connections. DNP3 has two, and so forth, so on, all the way down to SNTP.
The first LAN topology we'll look at is RS-232. This is a point-to-point -point connection between a DTE, which is known as a data terminal equipment, and a DCE, a data circuit terminating equipment. An example of a DTE would be a computer, and a DCE would be, for example, a universal relay. The design of the RS-232 is such that the input is capacitive or directly coupled to, to ground, which gives it a high impedance input. As a result, it acts as an antenna, picking up any RFI and EMI disturbances. The RS-232 cable is typically less than 15 feet for this reason, with a standard length of 6 feet. RS-232 uses large voltage swings to represent a 0 and a 1. The voltage swing requirement limits the upper speed of a compatible interface RS interface. RS-232 uses a Modbus half-duplex operation. On the front of the UR relay, there is a serial RS-232 connection. This connector is a female DB9 connector. The RS-232 cable that connects between the computer and the relay needs to be a straight-through cable with a male DB9 connector at each end. Three signals are used in the 9-pin connector. Pin 2 of one end is connected to pin 2 of the other. Pin 3 goes to pin 3. Pin 5 goes to pin 5. In a null modem cable, Pin 2 connects to pin 3 of the other end, and this cable will not work. For newer computers that no longer have a serial connection, the USB port can be used with an RS-232 to USB cable that is available from our online store. The part number is 0100-0001. This cable has a Windows driver so that needs to be installed into your, com into your computer before you can start using it. Next we'll look at the RS-45. The RS-45 uses Modbus communications in a half-duplex format. The standard allows for a connection of up to 32 devices. The connection is a daisy-chain connection where the data is transmitted differentially on a twisted pair wire. There is a maximum distance limitation of 1,200 meters or 4,000 feet from the start to the end of the daisy-chain connection. The baud rate setting of each device must match the baud rate of the network. Here's some things to keep in mind when working with RS-45. The daisy chain should, be, should consist of a shielded twisted pair wiring such as the Belden 9841. All the plus signals in the system are tied together and the same is true for the negative connection and for the ground. To avoid ground loops, which can cause intermittent communications, be certain to ground the shield at one end only. Make sure each relay has its own unique slave address. A duplication in slave address can destabilize the network. Lastly, add a terminator at both ends of the daisy chain. One at the beginning of the daisy chain and one on the last device of the daisy chain. The terminator consists of a 120 ohm quarter watt resistor in series with a one nano farad 50 volt DC ceramic capacitor across the plus and minus terminals of the RS-45 connection. Many advancements in Ethernet LAN hardware has resulted in creating high quality, robust and multi-vendor compatible hardware. It has become readily available almost anywhere in the world at a relatively low cost. It then follows that larger industrial and utility power applications have already migrated from the older proprietary RS-232 and RS-45 based LAN technology to Ethernet or are in the process of doing so. Over the years, several physical standards have evolved. The modern standards support full duplex Ethernet while the older standards are supporting half duplex operation. By far, the two most popular physical Sta layer standards are 10100 base T and 10100 base F, both support full duplex operation. Because of the need for higher speeds and data retrieval, the standard is now 100 base. Each has its own advantages, so it will be, ba so we will be, it will be these two physical standards that we will examine. The most common electrical standard today is 10 slash 100 base T. The 10 refers to the operating baud rate of 10 megabits per second, while 100 refers to 100 megabits per second. Most new equipment can operate at either baud rate, so the designation 10 slash 100 is involved to identify this capability. The term base stands for baseband, 
which means the entire bandwidth uses a single channel to transmit the data. The T, the T stands for twisted pair. The transmitter and receiver use separate pairs of wire for a differential signal with the wire pairs being twisted together. The base T Ethernet cable consists of four pairs of wires. The pairs are color coded with the first pair having a solid blue insulation twisted around a blue with a white stripe. The other pairs of wires are similar in constructions for orange, green, and brown. The four pairs of wires are then terminated into an RJ45 connector. This type of Ethernet connection is formally known as a copper Ethernet. A common question is for all the wire pairs used for communications. Well, it all depends on the cat number of the cable and the baud rate speed that will determine how many pairs are used for communications. For example, if the system speed is 100 megabits and you are using a cat 3 cable, all four pairs are needed. If you are using a cat 5 or cat 6 cable, then only two pairs are needed. Of course, this is what the copper connection or RJ45 looks like in a switch. So each cable plugs into each one of these positions. In power system applications where communications over larger distances are required, fiber optic ethernet is preferred over the 10 base, 10 slash 100 base T LAN medium. Fiber has an advantage over base LAN T in the fact that it is immune to EMI, electromagnetic induction, and RFI, radio frequency interference. A basic fiber optic system is made up of the following characteristics. A transmitting device to generate the light signal, an optical fiber cable to carry the light, and a receiver to accept the light signal transmitted. The fiber itself is passive in that it does not contain any active, active generative properties. Fiber optic systems have made advantages such as large bandwidth, lightweight and small diameter, easy installation and upgrades, long distance signal transmission, it is secure, and it is non-conductive. Due to the reflection off the walls of the tubes, the light source will attenuate, and as a result, has a limited range of two kilometers. The construction of the cable is such that the inner core has a diameter of 62.5 micrometers, with a total diameter of 125 micrometers. The second mode is known as single mode, the fiber optic cable has a narrow core. The construction is such that it acts as an elongated lens that continuously focuses the light into the center of the fiber. Based on the construction, there is very little attenuation. Distances of up to 100 kilometers can be attained using this cable. The construction of the cable is such that the inner core has a diameter of 8 micrometers. The diameter of the surrounding clad is 1 micrometer. The clad surrounding the, the core is highly reflective, adding to the inner dimension of the cable, increasing it to nine, 9 micrometers. The total diameter of the cable is 125 micrometers, and hence this cable is designated as 9 125 micrometers. The wavelength of light that are used in fiber optic communications are 820, 1300, and 1550 nanometers. At these wavelengths, the light attenu attenuates less than at any other wavelength of, of light as they travel through the fiber optic medium. 820 nanometers is only offered in multi-mode. 1300 nanometer cable is offered in both single and multi-modes, while 1550 nanometer cable is only offered in single mode. Even though fiber optics are robust, you still need to take into consideration two calculations, power budget and power mar margin. Let's take a look at each. Calculating the power budget for fiber optic cables is used to ensure that the fiber optic connection has sufficient power for correct operation. To calculate the link's power budget, you need to take the maximum amount of transmitter power in dBs and subtract the minimum receiver sensitivity measured in dBs. So in this example, we have a transmitter output power of minus 15 dBs and the receiver sensitivity is minus 35 dBs. Therefore, the power budget is calculated to be 20 dBs. 
Now, keep in mind that minus 35 dBs is a much smaller signal than minus 15 dBs. When reviewing the fiber optic cable's capabilities, we need to take into account all the items that may cause attenuation or link loss. The, the attenuation or link loss is measured in dBs and is the decrease of the signal strength as it travels through the median or system. Here are some factors to take into consideration. Losses per kilometer. Each mode type has different amounts of dB losses per kilometer. Termination points or connections. Each one adds 0.5 dB losses per connection. Splices. Each splice adds a 0.5 dB loss per connection. And finally, an operating margin. Then an operating margin adds 2 dBs per system. After calculating a Lynx power budget, you can calculate the power margin, which represents the amount of power available after subtracting link loss from the power budgets. A power margin greater than zero indicates that the power budget is sufficient to operate the receiver. Let's take a look at an example. We'll take a two kilometer long multi-mode link with a power budget of 20 dBs. First, we need to calculate the total link loss. In our example, the total link loss is 7 dBs. Next, we'll calculate the power margin. The power margin represents the amount of power available after subtracting link loss from the power budget. In our example, the power budget was 20 dBs. We subtract the link loss value of 7 dBs, and we end up with 14 dBs. Our next question is, is the PM greater than zero? If it is, the power budget is sufficient to operate the receiver. If the power budget is less than zero, then we need to add a, re a repeater or make changes to our system. So in our example, we had adequate power. This table is from the UR manual and it outlines the typical link distances based on emitter fiber type. It shows the different sources, the different light sources associated with the mode type, with the power budget associated with each type and the typical distance that can be expected. For example, an 820 nanometer LED in multi-mode has a 10 dB power budget that will operate for a typical distance of 1.65 kilometers. At the bottom of the table, the 1550 nanometer laser light source used in single mode has a power budget of 35 dBs and has a typical distance of 105 kilometers. This information is available in the Universal Relays operating manual. This table is from the UR manual as well, and it outlines the, the optical power budget for each emitter fiber type. It out, outlines the transmitting power, the receiver sensitivity, and the power budget based on the emitter fiber type. From the power plant to the power consumer, the Multilint UR family relays uses a single platform to deliver advanced protection, control, monitoring, and supervision of power assets across generation, transmission, distribution, substation, and industrial systems. The UR family features proven ex protected algorithms, expandable I.O., integrated monitoring, and high accuracy metering capabilities with the latest in communication technologies. The UR family relays uses digital fault recording and sequence of event recordings to monitor and record any disturbances within the systems. Predictive maintenance is provided by data analysis and trending. Synchrophasers based monitoring and control system with specialized PMU devices that support multiple feeders providing protection and metering class synchrophasers of voltage, current, and sequence components. The UR family relays provides the institutional awareness needed for a reliable, secure, and efficient modern grid. Let's look at the different applications associated with the universal relay. Under generators, we have two. Uh, one is the G60. The G60 is used on medium-large generators. The G60 provides comprehensive primary and backup protection for medium and large generators, including large steam and combustion turbines, combined cycle generators, generators and multi-circuit hydro units. The G60 includes advanced automation and communication capabilities, extensive I.O. options, and powerful fault recording features that simplify post-mortem analysis and minimize generator downtime. The G30 combines generator and transformer protection. 
The G30 is a flexible system that can be used on small and medium generators, generator and step-up transform arrangements, or backup protection of large generators. Similar to the G60, the G30 also offers comprehensive protection and monitoring elements. Under transformers, we have the T60, medium to large transformers. The T60 is a fully featured transformer protection system suitable for power transformers of any size that require current differential functions. The T60 provides automatic or user-definable magnitude reference winding selection for CT ratio matching and performs automatic phase shift compensation for all types of transformer winding connections. The T35 is basic transformer protection, multiple CTs. The T35 is a basic transformer protection system capable of protecting combined main power transformers and up to five feeders downstream. The T35 provides automatic and user-definable magnitude reference winding selection for CT ratio matching, automatic phase shift compensation, and allows users to en enable removal of the zero sequence current event for delta connection transformer windings. Under the transmission line, we'll start with the L90, which is complete line protection. The L90 is a fast and powerful high-end phase segregated line and current differential and complete distance protection system suitable for multiple medium voltage cables, two or three terminal transmission lines having breaker and a half, and single or three pole tripping schemes. The L60 has line phase comparison protection. The L60 is an extremely fast line phase comparison system suitable for two or three terminal transmission lines. This system is able to operate using power line carrier or fiber optic communications. The L30 is used for sub-transmission line current differential protection. The L30 is a cost-effective phase segregated line current differential system intended to provide primary protection for medium voltage cables and two to three terminal sub-transmission lines or backup protection to transmission lines. The D60 is a fully featured distance protection relay. The D60 is the ideal solution for providing reliable and secure primary and backup protection on transmission lines supporting series compensation, teleprotection schemes, five mo or quad distance zones, single or three pole tripping, breaker and a half with independent current inputs, phaser measurement units, PMUs, and more. The D30 is backup distance protection. The D30 is the cost effective choice for the primary protection for sub transmission systems or backup protection of transmission systems using flex logic elements. Basic pilot schemes can be programmed. The D30 has complementary protection, control, communications, monitoring, and metering functions that meet the toughest requirements on the market. The next application we'll look at is bus bars. We'll look at the B90, low impedance bus bar protection. The B90 is an advanced low impedance differential protection system that is intended to cover applications ranging from small to large substations having either single or complex split bus bar schemes. It is able to support bus bars with up to 24 breakers and four single phase differential zones. Next, we'll look at the B30. It also is a low impedance bus bar protection. It is a cost effective low impedance differential protection system that fits simple bus bars with up to six circuits and two protection zones. The next application we'll look at is controllers. Uh, the first one we'll look at is the C60, which is a breaking controller. The C60 is a substation hardened controller that provides a complete integrated package for the protection, control, and monitoring of circuit breakers supporting dual breaker bus bar configurations such as breaker and a half or ring bus schemes. The C30 is a IO logic controller and it's designed to perform substation control logic that can also expand the IO capabilities of protection devices and replace the existence of sequence of event recorders. Under distribution, we'll look at the F60. It's a feeder protection with high impedance uh, fault detection. The F60 provides a comprehensive feeder protection, control, advanced communications, monitoring, and metering. In addition, the relay has load encroachment, synchro check, and directional elements. The F35 is a multiple protection feeder protection. Uh, the F35 is a cost-effective device for primary feeder protection. It allows customers to protect up to six three-phase feeders or five three-phase feeders with one three-phase voltage input. The next thing we'll look under distribution is the C70. The C70 is a capacitor bank protection. So the C70 is an integrated protection control and monitoring device for shunt capacitor banks. 
the current and voltage-based protection functions are designed to provide sensitive protection for grounded, ungrounded, single and parallel capacitor banks and banks with tabs. The next application we'll look at is motors. Uh, the M60 is the motor protection relay for the URF family. The M60 offers comprehensive protection and control solutions for large size three-phase motors. The M60 provides superior protection, control, and diagnostics that include thermal model with RTD and current on balance biasing, stator differential, reverse and low forward power, external remote RTD module, two-speed motors, reduced voltage starting, broken water bar detection, and a whole lot more. The M60 has an advanced device health diagnostics that provides motor data of the last 250 starts with information such as acceleration time, starting, current, uh, thermal capacity, etc. The next application we'll look at is specialized network and control. This is where the N60 comes in. It's known as the Network Stability and Synchro Phaser Measurement Unit. The N60 is intended to be used on load shedding, remedial action, special protection, and wide area con monitoring and control schemes. So an N60 relay would be located at several points on this grid. Uh, each N60 shares real-time operational data to other N60s, so the system can generate intelligent decisions to maintain power system operation stability. Now, why do we have this? This is to decrease blackouts by identifying network instabilities and taking fast preventative action. With this, we can increase the utilization of existing investments by identifying power transfer, ca transfer capabilities on the existing lines. We can facilitate contingency planning through continuous synchrophase data collection and post-mortem analysis. Uh, there's constantly providing data to the SCADA system so that in the event of a fault on the system, uh, it can optimize system-wide load shedding and remediable, remedial action schemes to reduce the number of customers impacted by the fault condition. So next we'll do a GE product comparison by going into the selector guide that's uh, located at this uh, website. So here we are at the selector guide uh, the website and here the, all the different applications are listed for us uh, generator, transmission line, bus bar, feeder, transformer, motor, and digital metering. Under each application they have a list of the different GE products that are available to us. We can select an application type and it'll to explain it'll describe to us which relays are recommended for that particular application. If I go with something with say for hydro with parallel branch winding, it'll recommend these two relays. Along the y-axis, we have our different uh, applications available to us, our uh, the different uh, protection and control elements that are available within each relay, the automation portion, what's available, how many of each point are available for each type of for each type of relay as well. I can come back and do a direct comparison between the two relays. So if I select compare, I can come back here and say I want to select the compare the G30 with the G60. Now I have a list of all the different items, the differences between the two different products. If I want to see a PDF version of this, I can select PDF and it'll go out and it'll give me a printout of the selector guide for the generator portion. So we see all the different uh, ANSI codes here, the different products, and our applications, the number of the number of inputs and outputs and transducers and the different monitoring and metering uh, capabilities, the communications, and the protocols that are within each type of the products. This is true with the other with the other applications as well. If I want to go into the transmission portion, all the transmission relays are listed here as well. Everything D30, D60, the L30, L60, L90. Once again, 
we can select different types of applications based on our needs. If we're looking for pilot protection schemes, that'll go through and it'll just list those particular products, indicate which ones are suitable for this type of application, which, which ANSI code uh, protection elements are available under each one of the relays. Once again, if I want to see the PDF of this comparison of the, the selector guide for the, 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 the transmission line products, and go through once again and get this uh, selector guide that aids us in selecting which relay that we're interested in using. Bus bar, same type of idea. We can go in, we can select an application. It'll indicate to us which ones are, are suitable for this application. We can select the application code as well. We can go in, get more info. If we're looking for brochures or manuals for that particular product. The software, presentations, any support documentation, how-to videos. Let's go to the transformers. So trans here are all our transformer products. We can come in once again, we can select a specific type of application. This will describe to us which relays are suitable for the type of application. We can see the ANSI code diagrams for these particular relays as well. We want to do a comparison between two, uh, say, between the T35 and the T60. We can click on compare, select the two. And now we have a, a table that looks that will show us the differences between the T35 and the T60. If I want to see the PDF version of this, here's my selector guide for the transformers. Same thing is true of motors. This is our entire motor lineup, MM2, MM300, the M60, 369, 869, 469, and 339. The suitabilities for the different types of applications. A comparison of uh, the ANSI codes for this type of an application. types of ANSI codes that are available within the relays. And of course the PDF that's associated with, with the selector guide for the motors. The key pen, some of the key benefits of the UR is the modular construction. So it has a common hardware which uh, reduces the stock of the spare parts the modules are plug and play for maintenance cost savings and simplification. The amount of I.O. is easily expandable and multiple CT and v VT modules can be incorporated into the UR. Proven flexibility and customization capabilities make the multi-lane UR devices suitable for the protection and control of all critical power system applications. The InterVista UR setup software is the only application that needs to be loaded onto a computer to program the UR. It has high-speed communications via three independent Ethernet ports with IEEE 1588 time synchronization protocol support. The IEEE 1588 eliminates the need for iRigB requirements. Redundancy is available to increase the network availability via failover or as an option, IEC 62439-3, known as PRP, Parallel Redundancy Protocol. Uh, there is advanced IEC 6150 edition to implementation using a process bus, otherwise known as the BRIC. 
There's Cyber Sentry. This is our cybersecurity, which provides high end cybersecurity aligned to industry standards services, including NERC compliance, the RADIUS server, role based access control, and a system log. We also have phaser measurement units, otherwise known as synchro phasers, according to the IEEE C37.118 standard and the IEC 61850 90 5 directly streams from the universal relay. We have advanced fault and disturbance recording, including internal relay operating signals, limiting the need for external recording devices. Here we'll take a look at the design guidelines. When you were first designing a UR relay, there were multiple things to consider. Uh, things such as part obsolescence, spare parts, the constantly changing technology, adding new features, uh, user training and ease of use and serviceability. So the solutions that the design engineers came up with, as you can see here, were making the hardware modular and common to all applications. A single platform, one firmware used on all the UR relays, and finally a common user interface shared by all the UR relays. Here we see the functional architecture of the UR relay. On the left we have all the inputs and on the right we have all the outputs. So inputs from the CTs, VTs and analog inputs are put through an A to D converter to compare the thresholds programmed into the protection elements. The results from the protection elements along with the other inputs uh, digital inputs, virtual inputs, and remote inputs can be used in the flex logic block. The flex logic is the Boolean algebra that takes all the available inputs and applies them to the flex logic equation. The results are stored into the virtual output. From the virtual output, these digital signals can operate a contact output to open a breaker, send as a goose message via remote output, and send as a direct output to another UR. The universal relay consists of these six basic modules. The power supply module, which supplies power to the entire device. The CPU module, which handles all the processing of the analog and digital signals and communications internally and externally. The DSP module, or digital signal processor module, is the module that is used to monitor the analog current transformer and voltage transformer signals. The digital I.O. module is used to monitor the status of a contact, breaker, or switch to determine whether it's open or it's closed, and to also activate an external circuit such as tripping or closing a breaker. The analog I.O. module is used to read-write analog 4 to 20 milliamp signals used in legacy products and for measuring from RTD devices known as resistive thermal devices. The last module is the IRC, known as the Inter-Relay Communication Module. This module is used specifically for direct messaging between UR devices, such as used in line differential on the L90s. We'll talk in more detail about these modules in another training module. The picture of the back plane you see here is the high-speed data bus that is located inside the UR. Each module plugs into the back plane for internal communications between the modules. The UR relay is collecting vast amounts of data and must be able to operate as needed. As a result, there are three separate data buses in the backplane. One for communications with the I.O. modules, one for high-speed serial communications, and one for communications between the DSP and the CPU modules. Here we have the layout of the software architecture for the universal relay. We can see the features that are built into the software. We have protection elements, metering of the system, control of the protection devices, monitoring of system status, we've got an HMI, and communications. All these features are part of the common core software and the application software. That is to say that the features listed here are available both from the UR itself and within the InterVista UR setup program. The CPU module contains firmware that provides protection elements in the form of logic algorithms as well as programmable logic gates timers, and latches for control features. Each protection element has three signals or flags available. The first one is pickup, which means we are in an abnormal condition and waiting for a specific amount of time before the relay operates or reacts. The next signal is operator trip. We can no longer wait and need to remove the fault from the system. The last signal dropout signifies that the protection element has reset. 
Take a note the pickup and dropout signals are inversions of each other. That means when the pickup signal is active, the dropout is inactive. If the pickup signal is inactive, then the dropout signal is active. Input modules accept a variety of analog or digital signals from the field. The UR isolates and converts these signals into logic signals used by the relay. Output modules convert and isolate the logic signals generated by the relay into digital or analog signals that are used to control field devices. So let's take a look at each type of input and output. When we refer to contact inputs and contact outputs, we are referring to digital signals associated with a physical hardwire connection. The contact inputs are physically connected to switches, contactors, or breakers. The contact inputs require a wet connection, which means that they need a voltage to make them active. The contact outputs are physically connected to trip and close coils or some status indicators showing that the output has energized. Virtual inputs and virtual outputs are digital signals associated with internal logic signals. The virtual input is a software controlled input without any physical, physical connection to the outside world. The virtual outputs are the location where, where the resultant of a flex logic equation is stored. Analog inputs are signals associated with transducers that produce a 4 to 20 milliamp signal as an input to the UR. The analog inputs can also be RTDs that are monitoring temperature of a motor, generator, or transformer. The analog outputs are 4 to 20 milliamp output signals that are used for monitoring on legacy devices. CT and VT inputs are analog current transformer and voltage transformer signals used to monitor the AC power lines. The CT inputs support both a 1 amp and a 5 amp CT at the same time. Remote inputs and outputs are used for goose messaging in IEC 6150 communications. It provides a means of sharing digital signal states between relays. Remote inputs are goose, goose signals from other relays, whereas remote outputs are goose signals sent to other relays. The direct inputs and direct outputs are used for sharing digital signals between two UR relays over a dedicated fiber RS-422 or G703 interface. No switching equipment is required as the URs are connected directly in a ring or redundant ring configuration. This feature is optimized for speed and is intended for pilot-aided schemes, distributed logic applications, or the extension of the input-output capabilities of a single relay chassis. Next we'll look at a couple of different variations on the UR relay. Here we see there are two versions of the UR relay. We have the horizontal version on the left and the vertical version on the right. The horizontal version has the hinge on the left side. The vertical version has the hinge on the bottom side. The modules are interchangeable between the horizontal and vertical units. Both relays have drilled modules for serviceability, expandable I.O., flash memory, and are field upgradable. The horizontal version is 48.26 centimeters wide, which will fit into a standard 19-inch rack mount with a height of 17.78 centimeters. The horizontal case can handle up to a maximum of three CTVT modules, depending on the UR type. This means we can monitor up to 24 individual analog inputs. With a maximum of six digital I.O. modules, we can monitor the status, status of a maximum of 96 contact inputs or a maximum of 62 contact outputs. A maximum of three transducer modules allows a maximum of three transducer modules allows up to a maximum of 24 transducer inputs. The vertical case is 38.1 centimeters tall with a width of 19 centimeters. It is two thirds the size of the horizontal version. The vertical case can handle up to a maximum of three CTVT modules depending on the UR type. This means we can monitor up to 24 individual analog inputs. With a maximum of four digital I.O. modules, we can monitor the status of a maximum of 64 contact inputs or a maximum of 56 contact outputs. A maximum of three transducer modules are allowed up to a maximum of 24 transducer inputs. The vertical unit has all the functionality of the horizontal unit.